Hello and welcome to the Rubber Duck Dev Show. It's finally August, so it's really hot down here in Florida, but that's okay. My name's Chris. I'm Creston. And tonight we're going to be talking about how to write secure code, which ought to be just a, a whole lot of fun. Um, <laughs> It's actually, it's actually something that I like. If you're the I right like. person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually like it. I, I like researching the security things in the code and stuff. Um, so, it stresses me out. Yeah. Because I'm constantly thinking about, okay, how could someone break into this? And what have I, you know, what have I not thought of? Well, tonight we are going to talk about some tools that will help you reduce that stress because they'll think for you. So, um, someone else did the thought process. Yay. Uh, so yeah, I, I, security's a big thing and it's, it's getting bigger. Um, fortunately there's a lot of tools out there to help you with this. And we'll talk about a lot of those tonight. Um, first I'm going to set a few expectations. Uh, tonight's show is about code security, writing secure code. It's not about database security, server security, or network security. We may touch tangentially on those things, but that's not what we're going to concentrate on. Tonight is about writing secure code and making sure your code doesn't open up vulnerabilities. Um, so I want to start with a definition because this is something that a, a lot of new programmers, you'll hear this all over the place and you may not know what it even means. Um, and that is CVE. Uh, it stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. Basically, it just means security bug. But when they're when they're kind of listed, like if you go to Ruby and they list all their CVEs or a gem or something like that, they list them as CVEs. That's all it is, is security bug. Basically. Um, so with that out of the way, that's that's one for the, the newer programmers there. Uh let's talk about what it is that we're talking about. Can't argue with that logic. Yeah, so uh, let's take a look at one of the one of the best places to go and look around, which is the OWASP website. OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, uh, and it has just tons of information on security for web apps. Uh, and one of the best places to start is their 10 web application security risks. Hmm. Maybe I should stop talking. Anyway, this is their top 10, 10. web application security risks. Yeah, he can read. I can't. English, hard. Uh, so there are um, the top 10 here. Well, I want to touch on these just kind of not hugely in depth, but just talk about what they are so that you can kind of get an idea of what it is we're, we're trying to dig into here. So one of the big ones is injection, primarily SQL injection. Uh, that's where you've got form or something on your website somewhere where users can enter information and you pass it in and that information gets inserted into a query somewhere and run and it's not properly protected. And so people can put all kinds of crap into that text field, including uh, code. JavaScript code and all kinds of stuff. It can get really they nasty. They can escalate their permissions. They could query other types of data, et cetera. Right, and it's really easy to do. And if you watch, um, if you've ever looked into hackers and how they, how they approach getting into a website, this is one of the first things they try. Which is why this is the number one. Right. And uh, it's been number one for like a really long time. Right. So this is a very important thing to protect against. Uh, broken authentication. So this will include things like um, CSRF, cross-site re request forgery, uh, and other things that allow hackers to use authentication um, holes to get into your site and, and fake authentications, basically. Um, a lot of times it's using cookies that are passed through the sessions that aren't protected. Ruby, uh, like Rails, for instance, has CSRF protection tokens that it puts in automatically. Um, I have seen a developer take those out for some 
unknown reason, but don't just don't. <laughs> They're there for a reason. Uh, sensitive data exposure. This has more to do with database security, mostly. However, you want to be careful about what you're displaying to users. You want to make sure that you don't accidentally display sensitive information. Um, XML external entities shouldn't ever be a problem because everybody stopped using XML and uses JSON now, right? So moving on, right? That's just not even a problem. Why is it even up there? No, because lots of people are still using XML. Blech. Um, anyway, uh, the, the best way to protect against this is use JSON. Is don't use it. Yeah, right. Well, but the problem is, I mean, is that it is indeed external entities you're dealing with because like my code, I never use XML, but I have to use it sometimes when I'm communicating with an old API. Right. Yeah. If everybody would stop using it, this wouldn't be a problem anymore, but a lot of sites, a lot of legacy sites running on XML because before JSON, that was the thing. And JSON isn't that old, relatively speaking, not nearly as old as me. So anyway, we're stuck with it. But, you know, if you're using XML or you're accessing an external site that uses XML, passes you XML, you need to watch out for this stuff. Uh, broken access control is... Basically, I authenticate into there, into your site, and I'm supposed to have limited permissions, but you haven't locked down some parts of your site, and so I can get into other things like admin parts and things and not. Yeah, so it's so it's an authorization problem, not necessarily an authentication problem. Right. So it's, you trust that user, but not to do something <laughs> right. they're doing. Yeah, like, like I may be a user, but I shouldn't be an admin, but you've forgotten to lock right. down your admin section from me. Uh, security misconfiguration. This this has more to do with server stuff um, for the most part. Um, you know, the cloud storage and the the, the front end. Although there, and... although there is probably some framework configurations like Rails. Sure. Rails is pretty good, but there may be other frameworks where you're expected to configure certain defaults that are insecure. I, I don't know. Right. Well, and, and a good job you know, certain things the like box. there are some HTML headers that you should put in that, that have to do with security configuration and stuff. But th this one it, it primarily is going to be dealing with server type things, uh, as well as uh, making sure that your frameworks and stuff are up to date and not, you know, running a four-year-old version with 800 CVEs in it. Uh, Cross-site scripting, XSS, that's um, basically where somebody can execute scripts from another site on your site, and it's it gets a little goofy to try to explain, but it, it basically... It, it's kind of like site spoofing, where... They get into, a lot of times using like SQL injection or something, they'll rewrite part of your site to, then when somebody clicks on a link, they send them to a, a site that's not yours. Uh, and then they start collecting information from them. Um, insecure deser deserialization is kind of like uh, SQL injection, um, except it's not using SQL, it's using... Uh, serialized objects. So again, you might have a, a an open um, form on your site that isn't properly, that, that goes to an object instead of an SQL statement, and you're not protecting against deserializing and serializing that object, and so code can be run. Uh, using components with known vulnerabilities. So this is, you know, making sure your stuff is up to date, your gems, your frameworks, your, your plugins, that, that you're not running out-of-date things that have like, CVEs identified in them. Um, so you know, just keep your stuff up to date. Uh, and insufficient logging and monitoring. Um, again, this has more to do really with server security. Uh, so we're not going to hit on this a lot, but you know you kind of want to 
log and monitor what's hitting your server and that kind of stuff and keep track of, you know, is somebody trying to do DOS attacks or is somebody trying to do um, brute force password guessing or stuff like that. You can detect that stuff and there's a lot of logs and monitor um, tools that you can use. But that's but it's also applicable to code if like we were talking about exception handling last week. And if you get a hint through like a bunch of exceptions are firing because someone's trying things, yeah, you know, then that's something from a code basis you need to investigate and be aware of. True. I find it interesting where it says, quote, most breach studies show time to detect a breach is over 200 days. Yikes. Typically detected by external parties rather than the internal processes or monitoring. Right. And that's that's one of the reasons that that's one of the big reasons that we're doing this show tonight, this topic. I want to, we wanted to do this because if you start using some of the things we're talking about tonight, you will find the security vulnerabilities before bad guys will. And that's way better for your company. Um, I mean, I think, and maybe your company's different than most, but I would think so. Um, so another thing I want to look at from OWASP that I, I really like, and I've used quite a bit, and I actually bookmarked this thing, is their cheat sheet series. Um, this thing is fantastic. It's got a crap ton of cheat sheets in it that's all about security stuff. So like, here's the cheat sheet for Rails, and it talks about you know SQL injection and how what that looks like in Rails and how to prevent it and XSS and all that stuff. But they have, you know, stuff for .NET, they have authorization talks, they have error handling, which we talked about last time, but not this kind of error handling, really. Um, they've got .NET security. So they've got all kinds of stuff here that you can look at. Um, so I would highly recommend um, just having a bookmark to this site and referencing it once in a while. You're not going to want to use all of these. Like if you're not a .NET programmer or you're not a Rails programmer, you won't use that cheat sheet. But there's a lot of just um, good generic, general level security information in here. So highly recommend. By the way, all the stuff we're talking about tonight, we put links in the description. So they're already there. If you're watching this live on YouTube, you can already get to those links. Um, and they'll also be on the website. Yeah, after. they'll be on the website. And um, we will uh, try to do more of that going forward, getting links out in the descriptions before the show so that if you want to go check this stuff out while we're talking about it, you can. Um, all right, so any, anything else about OWASP that, that you like, that you want to talk about? Not really. I mean, really, it's, it's understanding each of these and what they mean and how they're going to impact the code that you write. And, you know, I would definitely consider it from a, consider from the priority, because the number one priority because of its danger is these, you know, the injection or the SQL injection. So looking at that, you know, the second is broken authentication, making sure that your authentication is sound, you have sufficient test coverage of what you're doing, as well as you are competent in, in any libraries you are using, mm -hmm. et cetera. Right. So basically I would just become familiar with it and dig into each one. Yeah, this is OWASP is not like a cover to cover type website. It's one of those reference books that you want to keep on your shelf. So it just, you know, if you're doing any kind of web app development, you really should have a bookmark here. Um, all right, so let's talk about, we talked about CVEs. Let us talk about ways to prevent yourself from running with crap with CVEs listed in it. Because CVEs pop up all the time. People are constantly saying, hey, there's a new CVE in this gym, or there's a new CVE in Roby, or there's, you know, Nginx, all the, all the things. So how do you help yourself not get in those situations? Um, how do you do it? So 
I don't use a lot of tools. I do have some tools, but primarily I sign up for the notifications. So like Ubuntu um, has a security list and they send out almost on a daily basis the patches that they send out. So I take a look at what's there, if anything's relevant to be able to say, okay, I need to patch my systems. Now that's not code security related, but it is related to security of the systems. But, you know, they'll include things like Nginx in there, et cetera, as well as signing up for my language security notifications. So like if there are, is a Ruby bug in Ruby and they've released a new version, I'm on the email list to get when that happens. Or if there's a bug in Rails or one of its main gems, I get notified. And I'm sure there are tools, I haven't used a lot of them to actually update your gems, but also GitHub does that as well. And, and on the Ruby, again, a lot of the main gems do report to the main Ruby list that people use. Um, like, oh, what's the one I'm thinking? It'll come to me in a minute, but there's one gem that frequently has updates because it deals with XML and parsing HTML and XML. Yeah. I'll so, remember in a minute, but anyway, but they notify, <laughs> even though that's a separate gem, they call out updates to it on the security lists. Right. And there are, I mean, it's important, to, to, I, I think, to su subscribe to those so that you get some notification of that. But it's also, I think, a good idea to have, especially if you're in a bigger environment, a team environment, to have automated tools that kind of run through and and give you a shout when things are going south. Um, so one of the things that um, that I've used, that, that we use, is called Dependabot. It's really good because it, it kind of keeps track of, I mean, it's really good for Ruby on Rails. It keeps track of your gem list and gives you, um, basically, cr it'll create a PR in GitHub automatically. Um, if something, if a CVE is found and you need to bump up to a different version, it'll tell you, hey, you need to bump to this version. Um, so it's it's a really good automated thing. Um, and there's other ones. There's one called Gym Insurance uh, by Appfolio. And it, it will also tell you, hey, you've got out of date things. And there's a vulnerable one here with this, this CVE in it. Uh, here's some more info on it. So it's really good as well. Um, it's also not a terrible idea to use things like this together. Put this on your on your system behind the scenes but also have like something like Jim Insurance running on your CI CDs or something, or even run it manually every once in a while, just to keep tabs on what's going on with your gem list. Did you scroll to the bottom of Dependabot? All the way to the bottom. All the way to the bottom. Yeah, it's free of charge now. Yeah, so I think GitHub, that's what I was saying. I think GitHub is doing this automatically, at least for my repositories. Right, I don't know but, how it's different. Yeah, but you can, I mean, it doesn't have to be enabled. Um, right, unless they've recently changed something, but it used to be that you had to, you had to opt into it. Well, maybe I did. <laughs> Wait, maybe they said something, hey, this is available, I opted in. So it, it works well, really well. It, 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 needless to say, get something like this or enable GitHub, uh, GitHub if it does that or if your source control tool does something similar. Right. Yeah, if you're not on GitHub, um, I go to it. It's awesome. But, um, you know, and this does work for more than just Ruby. I think it's best with Ruby, with the gems and stuff, but it works pretty well with, with other, like .NET, um, it's, it's working okay. Um, so, uh, you know, grain of salt and your mileage may vary, but it's a good thing to run, especially if you're Rails. Uh, and then Gem Insurance is really good too. Uh, it's, it's a little out of date, but because it doesn't, keep its own 
CVE list, it doesn't really have to be updated very much because it runs off of remote CVE lists. So not really an issue. Uh, there's another one called Hakiri that does uh, Ruby on Rails security checking, CVE checking. Uh, it is specifically built for Ruby on Rails. So um, if you're not a Rails shop, that won't help you much. But if you want to check it out, the links are in the description. Um, so that's kind of what you do for keeping your your gems and your plugins and your all your ancillary bits up to date um, and CVE lists. So what do you do about keeping your code from exposing things? So that's where you want to get into the rest of our what we're going to talk about. Uh, the first part of which is static code analysis. So uh, do you run any static code analyses security wise on your stuff? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> what do you use? The one you're probably going to mention first is at least with the Ruby code is Breakman. Breakman. I, it's for Ruby on Rails. There's, I can't imagine not having this it, and just run it as part of your CI CD or part of your RSpec suite runs or because uh, you can you can do all that. You can just build it into every time you run an RSpec, it runs a break man and off you go. Uh, but it's probably more useful in like a CI CD. But um, this will check all kinds, all kinds of security vulnerabilities in code and it'll tell you hey you've got potential sql injection vulnerability here on this line of code and you need to change this so that you don't have that anymore um and it, it does a really good job and it's updated quite often um i think this the 510 release is was pretty recent within the past few weeks i think um, but they've already updated this to Rails 6 and 6.1. Um, so it, it's kept up to date and it's been that way for very many years. Um, and it's free. So if you're running Rails, just just get this. Just There's not really a reason not to unless you're specializing in just Hello World programs. Um, just get it. I think they do offer, yeah, they offer a breakman Breakman Pro. Yeah. I think you can run that on um, like remote servers and stuff and it's all hosted and things. I don't think there's like additional stuff that it checks for the Pro version. I think it has more to do with... Uh, it's probably more for an enterprise or larger company. Right. To get it running on like distributed processes and things like that. Um, I've never had a need to go with the pro version. I mean, this, the free version of Breakman is just insanely good. So, all right. So, um, that's Breakman. There's also, you know, the, the kind of the top level thing, which is bundler audit. It's just a, a gem, uh, and you can run it, you just install it locally and you run it and it's just a patch level verification thing. It's, it's, it's pretty lightweight and pretty rudimentary, but it's also pretty quick. So it's kind of like a, the CVE version of bundle outdated. So, um, I would recommend running that as well. You mean it restricts it to CVE related updates? Pretty much. Yeah. It just looks for, hey, do you have any security issues, gem, gem level security issues? Um, so that that's a good thing. It, it may actually even be a good idea to run that in like a CI CD loop uh, as part of your part of your set there. Um, because Breakman, like you can run that, but Breakman doesn't really scan the gem. Yeah, issues. just your code. Right, so the bundler audit, in, in addition to that, will cover both sides. Um, there was one, there's one called Dawn Scanner that was, um, was really good, 
and supports Sinatra and Petrino and Ruby on Rails, but it hasn't been updated in like five years, four or five years. Anything security that hasn't been updated in the last month is dead to me. <laughs> right. So I, I think it's still relevant. things move so fast. Right. <laughs> I, I think it's still kind of relevant because it, again, it didn't use its own built-in CVE list. Um, it was relying on other inputs. But if it's that old, I, I don't know that it's being maintained anymore at all. Um, so, it, you know... It, it may be worth investigating, but I'm not going to spend any time on it. Um, speaking of which, Gymnasium, which was another huge one uh, from GitLab, is no longer maintained. They officially said, we're not maintaining this anymore. So, um, don't, you know, if you hear people talking about Gymnasium, which a lot of people still do, uh, I would stay away from that one too, because it's just not maintained anymore and hasn't been for quite a while. Uh, for those of you that use Robocop, which is a lot of Rails folks, there is, it has a plugin from GitLab, uh, a security plugin that GitLab did um, that will kind of do some of what Breakman does, but it does it in the Robocop framework. So honestly, I, I think if you have Breakman, you don't really need that. But if you're a Rubocop fan, um, there's well, a plugin for you. can run Rubocop, you. just don't enable that. Use Breakman for the, your security check and not... Oh, I do. Yeah, I run Rubocop. Yeah, I just, yeah. I, I'm not entirely convinced that this plugin is needed. Right, I'm just saying you can use it, but just don't use that plugin. You right. can use Rubocop, just don't use the plugin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, so uh, any other static tools that you have run across or that you like? I prim primarily use this. Yeah, and, and this is, at least in the Rails world, this is just what everybody needs to be using. And it points out a lot of stuff. I mean, I've been programming Rails for a long time, and I'll, I'll do a batch of code and then run Breakman on it and it'll pull up stuff and I go, oh my God, how did I miss that? You know, it's, it's pretty thorough. So, all right, so let us talk about the manual part of the automated tool set. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's, that's really checklists. Um, the, the only reason that I really like these is because it's a good way to go through and learn what these automated tools are really telling you. I don't think you should rely on them solely to check your code. You still should use Breakman, but they're really good to go through because uh, they help you understand and learn what's going on in the in the security world and the kind of things that you need to look out for. So, um, let's take a look here real quick. Here's one of them. It is the this is the one I like best, but there's there's others, and we've got some links for others. Uh, but this is the Rails security checklist. Um, I was mentioning Gymnasium a bit ago, and you can see they replaced that with Dependabot here. Uh, because it's that's updated and gymnasium is not. Um, again, this is this is a little outdated, but uh, not outdated. It hasn't been up, upgraded in a while, but it's just a checklist and it is a community um, a community list. So it did grow a lot, but it hasn't needed to change very much. But it, it kind of goes through a bunch of different things to help you start thinking about what you're coding. Like here's all the, a lot of things you need to be worried about when you're coding controllers, CSRF and authorization callbacks and authentication stuff. Um, here's things that you need to be worried about with routes and views 
and um, the secret tokens. So it, it, there's a long list here. And I found it, I've been through this several times and I go through it every once in a while just to kind of keep myself fresh on thinking about these kind of things when I code. And it's just a real, real good way to learn. And it's got a lot of stuff in it. Now, this one's specific to Rails, uh, but there are things like this for just about every language. I know there's one for .NET. Um, I, there's, I'm pretty sure I've seen one for Python. So, um, you know, I don't go through those because I'm a Rubyist, but um, these kind of things are very helpful for learning this and starting to be aware uh, of of this stuff as you code. So those are things I would highly okay. recommend you do. And then we've got some other other links for other ones down there in the description, and you can find tons of them by Googling. Uh, but do do check those out. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, automated tools. So we've done the static code scanning, right? And we've looked at the manual stuff just to kind of keep our brains fresh on here's the kind of things I should be looking out for when I'm coding. But now we want to switch over to looking at how do I test this stuff in real world situations uh, to make sure where I'm hosting doesn't have a lot of vulnerabilities. And I'm not talking about the server. I'm talking about when I've got this, my web app hosted, is it running properly? Can people get to it? Stuff like that. Or, or can people hack it? Uh, so there's lots of these. I, I mean, there's... Uh, I wouldn't doubt that there were probably 500 companies that do this kind of stuff. Not necessarily Rails, but um, security testing, because it's a big deal. Um, but here are some of the, the ones that I've run across that, and that you've run across that are good. Uh, so one is Guard Rails. Um, this one is specifically to be run against Rails apps. Um, and most of these will have a free tier. Uh, but what they do is they, they kind of try to attack different vectors of your real site or your staging site. You can set it up against staging, most of them. Um, but they see how things react in, in, in the wild, as it were. And they try to find ways to get inside your stuff. And they check for a lot of the same things that Breakman will check for, but they check for them from the front end instead of from the code end. Because there are things that Breakman can't see. Um, so it's good to run these kinds of things here. So guardrails is a nice one for Rails. Um... Detectify is good. Uh, there are, I believe it has a free tier as well. No, it doesn't. This one doesn't. Um, and the other thing to be aware of is these security scanners, most of them are expensive. This isn't cheap stuff, but it's much less expensive than having your website get hacked and getting sued by a hundred thousand people because you leaked all their credit card information. So 85 bucks a month is not expensive compared to that. Have you used guardrails or detectify? I have played with guardrails. seems to be really nice. I've run it a couple of times against a live site. Um, I've run detectify, um, ran that a while back uh, but haven't run it for a while how were these two different or are they checking pretty much the same stuff they're generally the same a lot of it has to do with the the gui and their design choices 
more well, than... Right, but, it, but basically it's still testing the same... Yeah, yeah. Stuff, okay. It's testing the same kind of things. I mean, one of them may test this particular type of SQL injection and the other one doesn't. It That's a different type as well as the 30 other types that they have in common. But so there are going to be some minor differences, but generally they're testing the same stuff. And these two are really close. Um, the, the, their main difference really is in their, their interface. Yeah, I've used a different one, but yeah. Okay. So here's one that's uh, that I kind of like because it's more of a local thing. It's called Tarantula. So, A, I love the name because it's just funny. I just imagine this hairy spider running through my code. It's like, and... it's like Netflix's Chaos Monkey. Right. Um, so it, it, it'll go in and kind of mess around with data and see if it can break things and do a bunch of mutations and, and all that kind of stuff. Now, it's a little out of date, but that's not really that big a deal because it's not trying to test up-to-date CVEs and stuff. It's testing for, yeah. you know, well-known and long-established security issues. And what you basically what you do with this is you set it up as a rake test and it'll, it'll go through and just run through your code against your local server or your CI CD server or wherever you put it, but it's just a rake task. But it comes back and and gives you oh, oh god you you've got a b problem here you you might want to check it out so um so yeah I, I would check that out because again it's free you can just it's just a gem and just set up a rake task and play with it i mean if you don't like it don't use it but i liked it um, now, one of the nice things that's happening more and more recently is that along with many other things, security checking is becoming open source. And I've run across this thing, Chariot from Praetorian, that is an open source security vulnerability scanner. So it, it kind of does the same thing as guardrails and, and um, Detectify, same kind of stuff. But it's all open source, which means it's all free. Um, Basically, you download it and you run it against your stuff. It's not a service doing it. Right, right. Okay. It's not quite the same as guardrails, but it's the same kind of thing. It's just you have to do it. Yeah. Uh Oh, we've got some... Yeah, garbage chat. All right. Anyway, moving on. Let me get rid of this dipstick. For those who are wondering what was going on, we thought someone may have been talking with us, but someone was just spamming us. Oh, it's not spam. Oh, or my, not. my apologies, Goro. <laughs> Oh, well, okay. No, it was spam. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, so. Let's see. Uh, anyway, this is this is free, so it's basically kind of you host it. Um, yep. But it, it's, it does all the same kind of things. But what's nice is that I'm starting to see a lot more open source stuff to help people with security scanning um, on the front end. I mean, like Breakman's been around for a long time. The back end kind of security stuff, free security stuff, open source stuff has been around for a while. But the up until recently, there hasn't been a lot in the way of front end stuff. So... Uh, Anywho. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of penetration software is open source. So this is just kind of the next evolution of it. And it is a form of penetration. Right, it is. And that's something that we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit is the penetration testing and what, why that's important. 
Well, it's um, essentially what this is, but it's it's automated. It's doing it in an automated fashion. That's what these tools do. They attempt to break into your site or break it in some way using automated tools that are just hitting it. Exactly. And and now it, the other thing, the other part of this is these are all automated tools. There are a lot of services that you can hire that are kind of like white hat hackers. They will manually come in and try to hack your site. They'll put a human brain behind right. it. <laughs> so if you're going for high security, like banks will use those people, they'll use stuff like this, but they'll they'll get the white hats on it too, because it's very important. These automated tools can only think so much. They only know what's been put into them. A live person can really break your stuff and they will go after things really hard. So if you're trying to get bank level security on your site or you're trying to get PCI compliance or something like that, you really should be hiring a a real person. I mean, using all this other stuff is great, but at the very end of that chain, you need to have white hats on, you know, just banging on your site to make sure it's secure. So have you ever used one of those live services? What do you mean, like guardrails? No, 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 like real white hat people. Oh, no, no, no. They are very expensive. Which it, is th why I haven't used those. Right. <laughs> that, this is, that's not something that most small shops or medium-sized shops would do. Um, but if you, if you deal with PCI compliance, it's something you, you probably want to really think about, uh, because PCI and this compliance, is if you're, it, it, well, this is if you are storing, transmitting, processing credit cards, right. yeah, if you're dealing with way, something like a processor, do, right. There are ways to do integrations where the numbers never hit your server, right. As so, long as you're never yeah. storing the 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 numbers and the inf the, the log card, the right, card right, information, right. you can do like what I forget what they call it. It's like a mini PCI compliance. Yeah, it's like a security assessment questionnaire D or something. You know, it's yeah. it's much less and doesn't require you know penetration testing. It's like three pages where the PCI is like four hundred pages or some ridiculous thing right. like that. Um, but yeah, and PCI full PCI compliance requires pen testing. And, and audits, security audits, and all kinds of stuff. So um, if you're into full PCI compliance, which, you know, not a lot of people are. It's going to be banks and payment processors and credit card companies and things like that. And and big, you know, like Amazon is PCI compliant because they actually store the, the stuff. But um, a lot of companies will just use payment processors and integrate with them and not have to worry about that. But you still should be running stuff like this to make sure, especially the free stuff. I mean, there's really no excuse not to do it um, because this, this kind of thing protects you from a lot of legal exposure um, from your customers. Because if somebody hacks into your site and steals their information, that's on you, you know? And if you can't say, well, I was using this and this and this, and then I've done it. I've done everything the due diligence to protect the user's data. If you can't say that, you're probably going to lose any lawsuits that come your way from that stuff. So, you know, take a look at all that stuff. Even if you're not storing sensitive information, it's just a good idea from a PR standpoint to say, hey, you want to you want to join my site i do all this stuff to make sure you're protected so uh so one other little useful bit that i want to look at and this is just kind of a a security aside for for um rails folks and that is um this thing called secure headers uh, basically what it does is it puts a lot of header information in your HTML for you 
to make sure that they're that it is very protected. Now, I don't know that I agree with everything they put in there, but it's not a bad idea to get it and then look at it and understand it, learn from it, and then take out the things that you don't think are relevant or leave it all in there. I mean, there are some things in there that can cause some speed issues and latency and all that kind of stuff. So you want to be a little careful, but you can see it has a lot of um, protections for things that we've kind of touched on. So it's a good idea to at least look through it and get ideas of what you should put in your HTML headers to protect yourself from stuff like this. Um, and this one is fairly updated. I mean, there's the, they're mostly just updating docs at this point because there hasn't been a lot of changes to HTML header specifications for things like this recently. So, um, but the, this is a maintained library. Uh, it's worth checking out. So, um, any other things you can think about for code security? Well, something that's just triggered my thought looking at this secure headers, because uh, you can also apply headers at the Nginx level. So like, I don't do a lot of setting of the headers uh, for security purposes, I think in, in Rails, like I haven't used this secure headers a library, but I do set headers at the Nginx level. And what I do for some validation of that is there's a site called ssllabs.com. And that validates your server certificate, but it also gives you a score based on how you've configured uh, SSL or essentially TLS now security for your web server. So it is kind of blurring the line between code and infrastructure. But that's another site I use to say, you know, once I've done my configuration or looking at an application, all right, what is the, is it getting an A plus on the SSL labs assessment, for example? Right. And that's the, the SSL stuff is usually fairly straightforward to check. And it's worth, I mean, even if you're not, if you're on a big team and you're not like I am and you're not the, um, the network person uh, or people, it's still a good thing to kind of pay attention to that and understand what's going on there so that, um, because understanding yeah, how the server security works helps you write code that will work better for that. Yeah, and because the lines are blurred because headers can be set at the Nginx level, headers can be set at, you know, the rails level. So it's kind of, you kind of need to work with harmony, work in harmony with whatever you're doing. Yeah. And because you can turn, I mean, in rails, you can turn SSL off for a particular page in the code, which you, you shouldn't ever do that, but you can, um, but you should understand the ramifications of doing something like that. It's, it's important to understand those things. Yeah, there's so many things that are being enforced with SSL. Like I've never ran SSL in my development environment when it when I'm doing development, but now I'm thinking to avoid all of these errors that the browsers now indicate, you know, because Firefox, if I'm using Firefox or Chrome, there's these errors, you know, and the whole same site attribute gives different reporting based upon if you're on an SSL connection or not. I think I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and again, run Nginx as a front end with HTTPS on my dev environment or try to figure out how to use SSL with, you know, a Ruby or an Elixir web server or something. Right. So, I mean, this is kind of to the side, but security has become so important and it's becoming more of a burden to kind of do the development side of things. Kind of like, all right, I'm going to have to implement security here so I know... <laughs> you know, avoid some of these errors. Cause sometimes I look, it's like, well, why is this error happening? What's going on? And I'm like, oh, it's only because I'm running HTTP in my dev environment. It's fine in production, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, and that's, I always ran SSL in my devs 
because I wanted to be as close as possible in my dev to my staging and production servers, so I knew what I was developing. But you're right. Lately, SSL has almost become a requirement because it's doing a lot more than it used to do. Well, I mean, everybody's essentially, and it's good, but you yeah. know, everybody's moving towards this is this is the way to go. Right. So. Well, and you know, it used to be a lot of people wouldn't would turn off SSL for things because SSL was slow. Uh, yeah, but that's but, not the case. But it's actually anyway. faster now, and you get SEO preference from Google for having SSL and all kinds of there's all kinds of benefits and not really any downsides that I see anymore. Um, but again, that's part of the security thing that's important to understand when you're doing development. You need to understand how SSL works and what implications it has um, for whether you use it or not. Um, now, do you enable SSL in your web application server, like your Puma in your dev environment, or do you are you running Nginx in your dev environment as a front end to your Pumas, for example? I've done both. It depends on the project I'm working on and how involved it is, but I have I have actually run Nginx um, in my dev environment because there were times, there was a project I was working on where I did that because I needed to be able to hit my dev environment from an external machine to test things across machines. If you yeah. don't have to do that, I don't really see a reason to run Nginx, just run SSL in your Puma or, or whatever your server is, but, um, but yeah, I have done both. It's not easy. I mean, it's not, well, okay. It, it's not a cakewalk to set that stuff up, especially in a dev environment with all the weird things that happen in dev environments. But um, once you get it set up, it's it's done. Yeah. So, and then, you know, you know, if you're testing something on your local, you know, it's going to have all the same behaviors that it will on a real um, server. So. That helps. So anyway, uh, I think we're bumping up against time here. Yep. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, if you did, please make sure to like, subscribe, follow, whether you're seeing this on Twitch or YouTube. And we shall hopefully see you guys again. Uh, we will be back you, next Wednesday. And if you have any thoughts of a show you would like to hear us disc uh, talk about or any content you kind of like for us to dedicate a show to, go ahead and put that down in the comments. Yep. Always looking for ideas. Always, always. Um, and next week, we're going to be doing database performance. Right. This will be the first in a three episode series on performance. Uh, we'll be talking about database performance and code performance and server performance over three weeks. So it'll, um, we should all have very performant things by the end of that time. But that's, that's, that's a constant battle. Um, speed and latency and, and performance and stuff. Um, that's, it's a big deal. So we look, we're looking forward to doing that show because it, it ought to be a lot of fun. Um, anyway, we will see you guys next Wednesday at 8 p.m. And we hope to see you there. Uh, peel, ple, pe, peels, peels. Okay, please. Please. <laughs> feel free to drop by, jump in, throw some comments in, and uh, have some fun with us. Um, until then. Happy programming. Bye. Yep. Bye.